Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody here at uh, Hakeve for inviting me and organizing. Great. Shall we begin? Shall we begin, Mr. Teleprompter? Okay. When programmers were first programming computers to recognize speech for speech-to-text applications, the biggest challenge they faced was getting the computer to understand that each different voice it heard belonged to the same language. The computer heard each person as if they were speaking their own unique language. All the physical properties of, speak, of speech unique to each speaking body, the size of the palate, the depth of the larynx and lung capacity, in addition to regional action, produces so much excess information that the computer could not understand how two people speaking the same word resembled each other in any way. And this computer, hearing each one of us speaking in a totally different language, makes us aware of the way we are also programmed to listen. We see how much of the voice of the other person we discussed in favor of semantic content, how adept and focused we are on the system of language and not the speaker as a language. Over the last five years, computers, however, are starting to hear more and more like we do. And by example, today's live audio essay, which is called Contradiction, Speech Against Itself, is a first in the history of voice technologies. For those listening in German, I'm primarying a new automatic translation software. This works by translating live speech, uh, live uh, my speech in, from English into uh, English text, and then translate that text into German text, and then it gives voice to that German text, uh, that German script, live into your ears seamlessly and almost simultaneously. This automatic translation system that I'm premiering today is software designed by an Israeli company called Per Se Limited, and the name of this software is Free Speech 4.0. In an unlikely and ironic turn of events, Free Speech 4.0 was made possible because of the whistleblower Edward Snowden. When he released the secret PowerPoint presentations of the US National Security Agency, he inadvertently released the missing part of a code that per se limited programmers desperately needed to complete their translation algorithm. The NSA were using a top secret, highly developed speech to text transcription that Edward Snowden leaked. They were so reliant on this software because even with the huge data centers they command, uh, that not even the NSA had enough data storage capacity to be able to store all the words, all the world's phone calls, Skypes, Facebook, FaceTime, and WhatsApp audio files. Text is so much less data hungry than audio, and is so much easier to search through later. However, it couldn't be that they were using the same speech to text functions that were currently available, otherwise, they would be storing a lot of nonsense. So this highly accurate NSA speech-to-text algorithm that Edward Snowden leaked and, and is now being applied to my voice via uh, Per Se Limited is, uh, is the way in which I'm being automatically translated into German. But the real genius of this uh, translation system is not the accuracy of its transcription, but the way my German voice retains the expressions, emphases, and emotions of my original speaking voice. It does this by measuring the tensions of my vocal cords as it translates and determines from them my kind of mental state and therefore the intention behind the kind of non-verbal vocal emphasis that I bring to the words I speak. Again, Per Se Limited uh, didn't invent this technique of emotional stress voice recognition. They also stole it. This time, it wasn't stolen from the NSA but through industrial espionage that they conducted against a fellow Israeli company called Neme Cisco. You see, Neme Cisco developed something to measure emotional response via the vocal cords called Layered Voice Analysis 6.50. The application of LVA 6.50 is not for achieving an accurate vocal translation, but rather for use as a lie detector. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Two weeks ago, I reluctantly appeared before the TV cameras to defend myself against the bizarre allegations that were appearing about me in the news media dealing with last year's anthrax attacks. These allegations were fueled by ongoing leaks from the Justice Department 
and those leaks continue to this day. Several days ago, the Justice Department representatives confirmed to the Associated Press that there was no evidence linking me to the anthrax attacks. Despite this lack of evidence, the premise, LVA 6.50, victimized in a never is that through a frequency analysis, the physio physiological conditions of stress are made audible by the non-verbal elements of a voice. This technology is said to be able to determine all sorts of psychological verdicts based on jittering frequencies, glottal tension, and vocal intensity, all regardless of the language that you are speaking. an effort to show the American people that it is proceeding vigorously and successfully with the anthrax investigation. It is currently employed as a lie detection method by the Los Angeles Police Department, Russian and Israeli governments, and insurance companies all over the world. The United Kingdom are using it to measure the veracity of benefit claims made by disabled citizens over the telephone. The main retailer of this software told me in an interview that based on the micro fluctuations of the vocal cords, LVA 6.50 can not only determine whether a person is lying, but is also able to deliver a whole series of verdicts, such as embarrassment, overemphasis, inaccuracy, voice manipulation, anxiety, and whether or not the interviewee is attempting to outsmart his interlocutor. The American In the future, I was told it will even be able to profile someone's voice to find out if they are a sex offender. A person of interest. <clears throat> LVA 6.50 is a lie detector that situates the truth not in what you say, but in how you sound. In the object quality of your voice and not the words you speak. In this way, the voice becomes divided into the words we say and the way we say them. This division of the voice produces two different testimonies from one person's speech. One testimony on behalf of language, and the other testimony speaks on behalf of the body. Often these two testimonies are corroborated by each other, but they can also betray one another. An internal betrayal between, between language and body, between subject and object, between fact and fiction, exists in a single human utterance. So what does it mean to speak the truth in the era of free speech 4.0? In the face of this new regime of listening, we still seem to cling to the increasingly outmoded rights and laws that govern our speech in society. For example, the human right to the freedom of speech. It may still be protecting what we say and the expression of our opinions, but not the expression of the voice itself. If the freedom of speech is to stand up to this new political context that our voice faces, it needs to be expanded to include and protect the sonic quality of our voices as well. Another of these laws, the right to silence, offers a mode of withdrawal from public speech, from the necessity to confess, yet it is the very withholding of our voices that can mute our political agency. The withholding of our voices also alleges guilt by virtue of its very withholding, as we see from those in government who espouse the defense of NSA and LVA. They proclaim consistently that only people who fear these systems or don't want to participate are those who have something to hide. So I went looking for another way to add another legal right to these more tried and tested uh, laws that govern our voices and patrol our ears. Looking for a precedent and a more robust means for our voices to retain their politics in the era of algorithmic regime of truth production, I found an old and esoteric piece of Islamic jurisprudence called taqiyya. Taqiyya is an old and obscure Islamic law, originally Shia. In its simplest possible articulation, taqiyya is a legal dispensation whereby a believing individual can deny his faith or commit otherwise illegal acts while they are at the risk of persecution or in a condition of statelessness. Taqiyya is often understood as the divine right to lie, though taqiyya is not lying. But it is not not lying either. Taqiyya is a contradictory condition of being simultaneously inside and outside of the law, like police informants who can legally commit illegal crimes whilst under the employment of the police. Taqiyya is an elusive strategy of survival that is both employed in day-to-day -day life and in the most perilous of situations. And for one little-known Islamic community called the Druze, Taqiyya is fundamental to their theological and so social practice. For the Druze, prayer is typically private, and there are no mosques found in Druze communities. 
Taqiyya then is the concept through which the non-coercive religious activity of the Druze is maintained. So here the belief that making one's religious thoughts public is a form of kind of sacrilege against the private dialogue you would have with God. So taqiyya is not only a legal dispensation to lie and an act of dissimulation, but a technology of withdrawal from the fundamental obligation to perform oneself in public, to speak on behalf of one's self, to confess one's heart of hearts. The Druze are transnational, spread across the Levantine countries and are concentrated in the mountain regions of Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, or Israel. Their practice of taqiyya is a product of their geography, a form of communication forged at remote altitudes, at the fringes of failed states, in buffer zones and on ceasefire lines. In late December of 2013, Jubhat Nusra, Nusra Front, took control of the Idlib province in northern Syria. As a result, 18 Druze villages in the region became subject to mass conversions from the Druze doctrine to Wahhabi Islam. Saudi national, Sheikh Sa'ad Sa'id al ghamidi led the mission. Al Ghamidi's crusade to convert the Druze was extensively and proudly documented and uploaded. In the images, we see uh, Al Ghamidi and Jubhat Nusra simultaneously armed with machine guns and humanitarian supplies as they entered the remote villages. Though the use of force here was always a present danger, violence was only ever enacted upon the speech of this community. It was their voices in particular that Al-Ghamidi came to elicit and take into custody. As there are no Druze mosques, and they do not pray in public, the first act of Al-Ghamidi's conversion was to teach one member of the Druze community to become the person who sings the call to prayer. By teaching one of the Druze to become a Muezzin, he constructs the loud audio infrastructure of Islam into villages which have only heard the hushed and private voice of religious belief before. The coercive and interpolating voice is still heard as a remnant of Al-Ghamidi's mission in the region, and he intends the Azan to be billowed from atop of this mountains as a form of sonic conquest. The second act of domination over the voices of this community al ghamidi performed was to sit in front of each of these villages, man, woman and child, and hear them say the speech act of Islamic conversion, words that once uttered aloud would officially initiate them into Islam. In all this video material, we hear no comment from those Druze converts and we only hear their voices as they are captured in the act of conversion or when they are singing the call to prayer. The silence of their resisted created a void of speech that was quickly filled by journalists and political commentators. Some claimed this conversion was merely an act of taqiyya and that these conversions didn't count as they were forced under the threat of violence. Others claimed that the community willingly converted and celebrated the event as a step towards Islamic unification. In the absence of vocal resistance to the conversions, one began to hear in the voice of the Druze of Idlib whatever one wanted to hear. And one can never know whether this was an instance of taqiyya or the truth, because in any act of taqiyya, truth lies in the ears of its beholder. Taqiyya is never the expression of one clear position but a multitude of statements that all emanate simultaneously from one voice. Each of its numerous truths are forged by and for the ears of its listener. <clears throat> so it became important for me to understand the events in Idlib, not only to get to the truth of what happened there, or not even to get to the truth of what happened there, 
But because locked into this event was the key to understanding the concept of truth in the age of free speech 4.0. So I went looking for answers and first I went to the Drew Scriptures. The book uh, that they use, uh, the religious book of the Drews, is never kept in one place. Rather, the chapters of the book are divided up and each chapter is housed in different homes so that the book is dispersed across an entire village. I had immediate access to one chapter and uh, there was really nothing relevant to taqiyya inside. So I went knocking on the door of the other houses in the village and see if some other person in the village might have uh, the relevant chapter and yet with every doorbell I rang I was sent to another house in the village and before I knew it I had arrived back at the house I began and without having had access to any other chapters of the book. So I sat there on the curb feeling defeated and was staring into the distance at a fruit tree on the side of the road. <laughs> on this tree, there was something moving in the wind and glistening in the sun. I went for closer inspection and saw that all the trees were covered in cassette tape from old audio cassettes. This was a vernacular technique to use the obsolete, obsolete media to ward off birds and stop them eating the fruit on the trees. So I started following the trail of cassette tape and this led me into an orchard of clementines. And deep into this orchard I noticed that cassette tape on the trees here was much thinner than in all the rest of the uh, places. And on closer inspection I realized that this cassette tape was from a kind of mini cassette, the type usually used in old personal dictaphone recorders. So anticipating a kind of biographical, confessional and personal content to this recording, I collected all the dictaphone tape and uh, I, uh, from the trees and I harvested the voice that was, uh, that was on the surface of these, uh, this tape. The voice on the cassette was mostly recoverable and to my great joy, what I found on this cassette was a scholar's personal interpretations of the Drew scriptures. At the beginning of the tape, we hear his voice identify himself as Wissam Abu Dargham a student of the prominent theological Druze scholar, Dr. Sami Makerem. There are sections of this recorded monologue that are specifically about the concept and practice of taqiyya, and it is these sections that I will play for you today. So here, Wissam is where he first defines the concept of taqiyya. And I will have to uh, translate what he says because it's, um, it's a bit messed up, the tape. In our part... In our part of the world, mothers talk to their newborn babies in a language called Apu. Did you hear that? In our part of the world, mothers talk to their newborn babies in a language called Apu. It's a two-syllable word composed of and Apu. It's a two-syllable word. It has no meaning. It means nothing. And Apu. It's just two sounds. Apu. With a newborn child. It's used to communicate baby, with a newborn child. It doesn't have any way of processing this information in its brain to really understand anything other than the abstract sound of the mother's voice. The, doesn't have any way of, the baby doesn't have any way of understanding the meaning other than just the abstract sound of the mother's voice. So what does the Ingr Apu communicate? There's love and it is care. They don't make any linguistic sense, but transmit the mother's love. So the child receives these two sounds that don't make any linguistic sense, but they transmit the mother's love. The language will grow with the child as the mother will raise the, mother, will raise the communication skill to a higher level. The language will grow with the child and the mother will raise the communication skill to a higher level. When the child has grown older, the mother will say, let's go for breakfast. Then, when the child grows older again and goes to school, the mother will say, take your sandwich with you. Did you hear that? When the child grows older, the mother will say, let's go for breakfast. When the child grows older again, the mother will say, take your sandwich with you. When the child becomes a student in college, there is no way the mother will say to her child, Apu. When the child grows old and goes to college, there is no way the mother will say to the child, Apu. The tapia means the, the means of communication that you adapt to any person based on the amount of knowledge that he or she is capable of understanding. Tapia means you speak to people on the ready. Taqiyya means you speak to people on the level of the other's readiness to listen. Taqiyya means you speak to people on the level of the other's readiness to listen. This is Wasam's 
definition of taqiyya. From an early age, Druze learned how to pronounce correctly all the Arabic phonemes, which is not done by any other group of uh, Arab speakers from the Gulf to the Atlantic. The correct pronunciation that many Druze speak is made audible to most other Levantine Arabic speakers by the articulation of the Arabic letter Qaf, a letter most closely aligned with the English letter Q, but here the sound is produced at the a Adam's apple. So it's this one. Let's try again. The Druze have become known for pronouncing this letter as throughout the Levant. One rarely hears this letter articulated as it appears in the alphabet. But here's it dropped and pronounced as earth, replacing the calf sound with a glottal stop, similar to the British T in the word butter, which is often pronounced butter. Butter or butter, taqiya or taqiya. So this is actually another point that Wissam makes. Truth means that you have to respect the words. Truth means you have to respect the words. You have to pronounce it as it is. When you respect the truth of the language, you have to pronounce it as it is. To elaborate your pronunciation properly as the language intends also carries a meaning with it on the level of truthfulness. To elaborate your pronunciation properly as the language intends also carries with it a meaning on the level of truthfulness. We pronounce all the Arabic phonemes correctly in order to stick to the basic rules of the language itself. We pronounce all the Arabic phonemes correctly in order to stick to the basic rules of the Arabic language itself. If I pronounce the letter Qaf as I'm not saying it correctly, so I'm not speaking the truth. If I pronounce the letter Qaf as Qaf, I'm not saying it correctly, so I'm also not speaking the truth. I'm not saying it correctly, so I'm also not speaking the truth. Both words in the Arabic language that mean truth, haqiqa, and trueness, sidq, both contain the letter Qaf. Which means to literally speak the truth, one must pronounce the Qaf. If one drops the pronunciation of the, of the Qaf and pronounces the uh, word truth with a glottal stop, which would be uh, Haq as ha, they are simply not speaking the truth as it truly sounds. So here the sound of the word and its meaning are in a highly sensitive relationship and the theological context for this is that God created the Arabic language and its words are considered divine creation just as much as the things to which those words refer. So that means that the Arabic language under, the, under this conception is not a representation of things in the world, but actually language is another mode for that thing to exist. Language is thing. The sound of the spoken word in Arabic is therefore, under this conception, inherently onomatopoeic, whereby the form of the thing and its sound are one and the same. In fact, onomatopoeia in English has come to mean words that mimic sound of the thing to which they refer. Crow, bell, wood, drum. But its original meaning is a composite of Greek words that mean making or creating names. The original forging of vocal sound to an object. A process that is at the genesis of all languages, regardless in the belief in uh, God as the creator of language. So, in all of its articulations, God intended truth to be enunciated with one's Adam's apple. Siddiq, Siddiq lisan, literally, the trueness of the tongue, is the term used to not only govern speaking of the truth, but pronouncing the words correctly. Yet the Druze have another way of writing this word, Siddiq, literally, uh, sincerity or trueness. They have another way of writing Siddiq from other Muslims. You see, Druze replaced the Saad sibilance with the other S sound in Arabic, seen. So rather than pronouncing it sincerity, it's pronounced sincerity. You see what I mean? It's not sincerity, it's sincerity. Seen, Saad. So Sudq becomes Sidq. 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 Here, the pronunciation of the truth, whether Sudq or Sidq, remains almost completely intact. There is a small deviation. If you say it quickly, it's, you know, you get somewhere. 
In sound, it's a very small deviation, almost too minute to pick up. And if you're really not listening out for it, uh, you won't hear it. Though the form of the written word is completely altered, completely. Truth, though it may sound the same to those who hear the word pronounced, literally takes a different form. So by deviating in the spelling of the truth, it is claimed that there is another understanding of what it means to speak the truth amongst the Druze. Mostly other people claim that. That speaking the truth is not about what you said, but in the way of saying it, in the pronunciation of the letters themselves. So you can always be pronouncing the truth, while in fact the meaning of the words you speak are not so faithful. You see what I mean? You might, truth is, can sound true, but not necessarily true. However, this non-verbal truth can be at times just as revealing. For example, pronouncing the qaf would often reveal your true identity as Druze, as it is mostly only the Druze who pronounce the qaf. So even if you claim something to the contrary, the qaf speaks for itself. It doesn't speak at the readiness of the other to listen, adapting to their way of hearing. Rather, it asserts its difference on the ear of your interlocutor. A difference that has been historically fatal to reveal. And uh, Wissam also makes an interesting comment about this. I'm not saying it correctly, so I'm not speaking the truth. I'm not saying it is before. One of the main mistakes of the Druze minority is that they are not practicing taqiyya properly. One of the main mistakes of the Druze minority is they're not practicing taqiyya properly. If you take the case of the Druze community worldwide today, or any other minority, the mistakes of those minorities is that they take on a group ego. So if you look at the case of the Druze, uh, the mistakes is that they take on a group ego. They make a sign above their head saying, hey, look at us, we're a minority. And in the understanding of taqiyya, you have to blend into your surroundings. Taking on a collective ego is a breach. And in any minority, if they really are practicing taqiyya, they should not label themselves as an identifiable community. So according to taqiyya, if I'm a Druze living in Beirut, surrounded by non-Druze who don't pronounce the qaf, I should not pronounce qaf, I should pronounce qaf as af. If I'm living in the mountains, in a Druze area, I should pronounce the qaf qaf, unless the af is accepted there. I should vocalize it qaf. But in general, if I speak with af or qaf in any community in order to get attention to my ego, under taqiyya I'm doing something wrong. So it's a very thin line because speech is really interconnected and entangled with ego. So in linguistics, the name for taqiyya is accommodation theory. And accommodation theory identifies two different types of speaker, converges and diverges. The divergers are those stubborn individuals who maintain a form of speech that is distinct from those they are speaking with. This will to diverge is a mark of their linguistic territoriality or other vocal origin to which they strongly identify. The convergers are those generous souls who assimilate through a constant process of dissimulation, constantly adapting, always able to willing to inflect their speech to be in greater proximity and conformity to those they are in dialogue with. The converges are those who constantly deviate from their true linguistic origins or perhaps are simply not bound to any linguistic origin at all. Rather than a speech that identifies itself and is in turn easily identifiable, the converges speak in many accents with multiple tongues. Their speech is malleable and mimetic, contagious and contaminated. Yet those who practice taqiyya are neither converges nor divergers. They are a rare amalgamation of the two forms of speech, a converger-diverger. When one speaks uh, taqiyya, with each word they pronounce, they are making a sound that is at once dissonant and consonant to the ears of those who hear them. A woman is talking with a friend without using the letter qaf. But when a member of, her, member of her family calls her on the phone, her deep glottis suddenly springs into action. What you hear is a subconscious practice of taqiyya or code switching that is deeply embedded as any other instinct of survival. If you don't speak Arabic, you're at a distinct advantage. You're able to listen to this recording as pure vocal sound. So listen for the qaf. Please.
مشان هيك هلا انا ما بعمل فيها شيء كل ما بدي اعمل شيء قالوا ماما ما فيها عن جد حتى قلت لها اسم الله صارت كثير كبيره بده يتغير البو بدك تجي تشتغليها شيء يوم توكينج ابوت ا بلان ذات هاز بين ان ذا فاميلي اون تايم حكيها هلا وانا هون لانه بدنا الريسيبي تبع التاكوز تبعو If you speak to your mom now tell him I tell her I want the recipe for tacos Hey it's a good time يلا الو ايه ماما هاي كيفك ايه شو شو عم تعملي اه خلاص اخذت نيمه ورجعت ايه جود ماما كان بدنا نسالك عن هالشتله هيدي العظيمه نسرين عندي واستحلتها كثير بلا ماما الشتله اللي جبناها من جده شو بك ايه عم تصفر كثير وما مش عارفه شو بدي اعمل لها قولك هيك بحط لها شوي حديد من هو تبع الجردينيا يعني ايه اوكي ايه حياتي ليكي معك شوي وقت اسألك شغلة تاني بعد مم. ايه كانت نسيت بدها تسألك عن الروسات التاكوز ايه كنت تتذكر كنت تعمليهم اياهم هن وبس سو تقية is not unlike the freedom of speech ايه يلا اذا قلي لي نتفي هيك ونتفي هيك it is the right for free expression but it is more like the freedom of the speech itself rather than the freedom to speak it is the freedom to use your voice to mimic and mutate to dissimulate in order to navigate the sometimes hostile terrain of those ears that prey upon your voice It is not the freedom to stake a claim, nor the freedom to say whatever you want, but the freedom to use speech as a tool to become anything you want. And with Sam also compares this to the freedom of speech. In the freedom of speech, I'm legally allowed to say anything, to say whatever I want. But when we think about this in relation to taqiya, it's more like the freedom of speech is the freedom to remain silent. Taqiya means that I'm allowed not to speak. If silence is not part of the freedom of speech, then speech will not be free. Taqiya is not unlike the right to silence. Sorry, hey, but something. Her daughter calls her now. Hi. شو يعمري؟ You're coming home. لا شو فيه؟ تقية is not unlike the right to silence. كتير مني حيا لا يعمري. أنا نطرتك و it's great. عندي حدا نعم عندي عندي أصحابه لخيلتك. Okay. وبيقولوا ليك. Hi. Taqiyya is not unlike the right to silence, the legal right against self-incrimination, or pleading the Fifth Amendment as it is often referred to in the USA. Taqiyya is a legal dispensation to not speak the whole truth if the truth may cause you harm. Yet silence and secrecy infers guilt in today's all-speaking, all-hearing world. And Taqiyya's strength is that it can exist as silence in the guise of speech. Taqiyya does not produce the loud, present absence of silence. Taqiyya is silence camouflaged by words. In Taqiyya, there is no binary division between what one says and what one does not say. There is not one but many silences that fill the spectrum of speech. From Ingr Apu to the Pledge of Islamic Conversion, a whole range of silences can be employed. Unlike the freedom of speech, the right to silence is not a human right and only granted to citizens of nations who employ this law. So in conditions of statelessness, or in precarious jurisdictions, or in any other context where silence itself is criminalized, taqiyya will continue to play out in the minutia of human utterance. It is adapted by individuals who inhabit in-between spaces, and it is in fact a legal right to inhabit such in-between spaces. The space in between truth and lie, the space in between the act of saying and what was recorded as said. The space in between resistance and capitulation, between converger and diverger. Taqiyya is simultaneously a subservient and subversive form of political action. Taqiyya is a contradictory concoction of simultaneously speaking freely and remaining silent. Taqiyya is the only legal right that recognizes the inherently unfaithful nature of the voice. And Wissam has the final comment. Taqiyya is the truth. Taqiyya is the truth. Bye-bye.
Thank you all, and thank you, Anselm. Thank you for the opportunity to hear Lawrence's wonderful talk, presentation, and for humoring my technology problems. I have a very old laptop which I'm holding on to forever um, until, they actually, until it falls dead on me because it has exactly the keyboard I want. <clears throat> right. So I'm going to be talking about something that is quite closely related to both of the things that Anselm and Lawrence were talking about, and that is the development of what I think of as a, a distinctive mode of capitalism, um, which will apply to a large area of the world and to a very large portion of the global population. I think when people think about biometrics, in Europe in particular, to some degree in the United States, they're accustomed to thinking of it in terms of as an instrument of political surveillance, somewhat like the things that Lawrence is talking about. So the National Security Association, uh, whatever it is, the NSA's attempt to try and monitor people uh, and to track their movements around the world. It's no question that the states that have gone furthest in pushing biometric registration systems on their populations are what we would call the counter-insurgent states or the anti-communist states. The state in Europe that's taken this further is Spain. It's not an accident. It's a, it is a path dependency. It's related to the history of the 20th century. Argentina, Chile, Mal Malaysia, Pakistan, and South Africa are the ones who've gone furthest in developing fingerprint registration systems. And the US Department of Homeland Security is unquestionably the main global agent using the doctrine of defense in depth. So their idea is we go out and fingerprint people in Afghanistan or in Iraq, then we'll find them when they come back to the United States. And Chertoff, who was the Secretary of Homeland Security, has, has explicitly endorsed biometrics on, this, on these grounds. Now, to go back to McTarsic, Tarsic is the one who should, initially drew our attention to the fact that what we're looking at when people make arguments like this is in fact an argument about sympathetic magic because there is no capacity to use what we would call fingerprint fragments or latent fingerprints to identify people or the activities of people on, on <clears throat> in safe houses or in bombs. It just doesn't work like that. What you can do with 10 good fingerprints is one thing. Taking a fraction of a, of a fingerprint, I would say there was no respectable biometri biometrician, and I'm talking about the scientists, who would sign off on an, on, in a court to the kinds of claims that the NSA makes. But they are working on it very energetically, and who knows, maybe there will be a mathematical proof sometime in the future. In fact, what we're looking at is biometrics in a, <coughs> affecting the poorest people in the world much more dramatically than the national security targets. Now, capitalism is a funny business on the, on the African continent. For most of the last century, more people, vastly more people, have been involved in agriculture and in trade, but the form of capitalism and the institutions that capitalism is dependent on have been, has been dependent very largely on mining and on mineral extractions, and in particular in the last 10 years on oil. It's these things that have dominated investment, they've dominated state revenues, company revenues, individuals' incomes, and especially property forms. So the forms of uh, mineral titles that people have been able to exchange and make enormous amounts of money without ever actually exploiting anything, those are the things that have been dominant in the form of capitalism that developed in Africa. The actual system itself has been described by scholars in many different ways. Some of you will know Jim Ferguson's work, and he stressed what we would call the enclaved character. In other words, an oil company will come in and it'll, it'll set up the infrastructure it needs in a very small space and more or less ignore 99% of the territory. This is an extension of an, of an argument from Walter Rodney, who always drew people's attention to the rails of line, the, the railway lines that run from the harbor to the mine and ignore the populations. We're familiar with Jean-Francois Bayard's theory of extroversion or, Ted, or Fred Cooper's ver, uh, take on it, which is to stress the gatekeeping quality of the state. We know Jane Geyer's excellent work on the ways in which Africans have actually reworked systems of value on the continent and the, and the large amount of work that focuses on the intrinsically violent nature of capitalism in Africa. Now, the story I'm interested in talking about tonight is different, and it breaks with the most influential explanations, some of these are my good friends, of Africa's place in world capitalism and these are people who typically, as almost as a matter of political principle, deny the viability of a single project of capitalist transformation on the continent. 
excuse me, I'm going to grab some of this. Now, my argument is much closer to Jim Ferguson's, and some of you may know his recent book, Give a Man a Fish. He argues that emerging from South Africa is a doctrine that says we, a basic income grant is just about the only way of handling the cont contemporary problems of capitalism in Africa, but probably many other places as well. And I draw extensively as well on D.A. McKenzie's work on the problems of redistribution in a world without work, without formal work, where financial institutions dominate the production of value on it using algorithms and automated systems of calculation. Now, there is a long and excellent tradition of argument that capitalism isn't one thing, um, aside, despite what Marx has said about it. My own particular interest is in the work of a man called Maurice Sklar, who looks at the development of corporations in the United States and argues that there is a distinctive mode, distinctive forms of property, distinctive kinds of political association that develop in the United States around 1910. And we would say many of those things have persisted into the present, some have not. It's well established now that there are many different kinds of capitalism, many ways to skin the cat. And different regional modes have distinctive forms of property. Different kinds of intangible forms of property in particular are developed by particular kinds of law. And these things are important because, as you'll see where I'm going, and they reflect political order and they reflect conflicts. So what is biometric capitalism? Well, biometric capitalism is a system of economic activity organized around a centralized it's a unitary database of biometrically ordered population registering, registration where the, where the identification is done on the basis of typically of people's fingerprints or some other object on the body like the iris that can allow for unique identification or close to unique identification. It's justified morally and politically by the politics and the technologies of cash transfers. Now this is where as happens in South Africa, 40% of the population receive a monthly cash transfer, a cash payment from the state. The only way in which that can really be done effectively is through a biometric system. And there are many tentative forms of a similar basic income grant on the, on the African continent. Uh, I won't bore you with the examples, but most states are experimenting with some way of, of directing cash into the lives of the vast majority of people who are locked out of formal work. And it's integrated with the requirements in, on the African continent uniquely of the commercial banks. And the banks are the ones who are often funding the development of these population registers. So they are developing shared infrastructures for credit surveillance that are derived from the original FICO scores. I'm sure people have some familiarity with those scores and the Americans are very familiar with them. They determine the mortgage that you pay very t usually in the United States. And these, this FICO the FICO algorithm has spread very widely around the world and it has been adopted very enthusiastically in the last five years. Drawing on automatically generated feedback data from already existing mass credit and welfare transfer systems, non-governments and governments are pushing the, de the development of tracking systems around crash cash transfer schemes and student loans. So if you've paid any attention to what happened in South Africa last year, the students' big complaint is that the debt that they have to cover their university, which is actually most of it not for fees but for subsistence, is handed over to the banks. If they don't service the loan, they're black marked very quickly. That is the first thing an employer queries when you go and apply for work. In other words, have you been servicing your debt? And if you haven't been servicing your debt, you don't get shortlisted for an interview. You lose your opportunity to actually develop employment that will ever allow you to pay back the loan. Those loan schemes exist in almost all countries on the continent. Now, these systems are very strongly influenced by infrastructures of biometric government and banking that were first developed in South Africa over the course of the last century. It's very important to understand that biometric capitalism confronts two fundamental problems about the nature of the state and the economy on the African continent. And the first of these is that unlike the conventional Weberian and Foucauldian understandings of power knowledge, states on the African continent have managed to persist and sometimes to thrive with radically constrained knowledge about their populations. Most births and most deaths are still not recorded. 
In South Africa, we have a sophisticated state. We only started recording a majority of births in 2002. The census data is incomplete everywhere. It's non-existent in many places. It's contested almost everywhere as well. And it has been like this in the for the last 50 years, and it was like this throughout the colonial period. Unlike India, African colonial states did not count their populations. They had no interest, really, in anyone except the white people who lived in the cities. Registration of people and land, especially, is very limited. It's fragmented and tentative. And this means bureaucratic systems of identification, the birth registers, the birth certificates people are, are very commonly aware of, are weak throughout the continent. And it's important to have in mind, while you're thinking about this, that biometrics and paper-based registration systems have been in conflict on the African continent for a century. It's not new. So 100 years ago, the colonial officials were saying, don't listen to Africans, they'll lie about who they are. The only way you can know for sure is if you record their fingerprints. And much the same juxtaposition exists today. It hasn't, it hasn't gone anywhere. So that's the first problem, which is the fundamental official incapacity of the state. The second is demography. And I don't think people are as aware or alert or as conscious of this as they should be, but most African states have experienced dramatic increases in population over the last generation, going from comparatively low densities to some of the highest ever recorded. Now, there's a very rich, fascinating debate in African history over the facts and implications of population density. There's a whole group of historians who argue what is distinctive about Africa is the low population density. This is people like John Eilif and... and, and and Jan Isaac, uh, Van Sina, they say all the arguments about politics, the precious character of life, uh, the, the fact that people don't value land, they value people much more than land. There's a huge dispute about whether in fact this is the case, and there are a group of historians who say that the estimates of, of est that are, are in fact too low, that there were a much higher population in the 1700s than those people acknowledge. But let's just go over the possibilities. In 1800, there was some number to between 50 and 140 million people in the African continent. This is the whole continent, including North Africa. In 1900, some number to between 100 and 150 million. By 1950, something around 230 million people. By 2000, the figure had reached 1 billion. By 200, the current UN estimate is that for 2050, it will be between 2 and 2.5 billion, and that by the end of the century, there'll be between 4 and 6 billion people on the African continent. They'll make up something like 50% of the human beings on the planet. This will be the highest concentration of human life ever recorded, higher than China or the Netherlands. So something has to be done, and most states are scrambling to build bureaucratic mechanisms to get a grip on it. In each case, we can see a convergence towards an administrative architecture that emerged first in South Africa. Uh, it's radically centralized biometric identity registration, privatized biometric cash transfers, universal credit histories, credit histories that come to serve as a kind of instrument of moralization. So when nothing else really works, we can identify what kind of person you are by looking at your credit history. Now, these things depend on all sorts of tools, um, there's a kind of proliferation of devices, and some of those devices are being in, in, made available and spread through the continent by election systems that are usually funded by the European Union. There are other examples around the world, and I won't belabor them. The most important is Nilakani's UID project in India. And, you know, we can say a lot about it. There are two things that are fundamentally, that stand out. The first is that this is not a card, it's a number. You just get a number. It is a purely intangible object. People have demanded a card, and lots of them have started laminating these plastic, these paper receipts. But that's not what you're getting from the government. What you get from the government is, an, is a number only. The second thing is that a billion people have been registered in the last five years, which makes it the, by far the most successful registration project ever attempted. There's never been anything else quite like that. These, ki these biometric kits, which are being used to, to, to register people under ADHA for elections in, on the African continent and for almost all the ID card schemes that exist are in themselves a kind of actor network. There are obvious, there's an obvious presence where all over the continent of globally standardized cheap smart cards, wired and wireless networks, XML of minutiae abstraction systems, 
cheap Logitech imaging devices, and you know, you should just pay attention to the, the whenever you're wandering through an immigration portal, and and see how much kit now exists to make how, make it easy for the state to capture our biometrics. Like the world of mathematical abstraction in general that Theo Porter and others have described, or the feedback engines that Zuboff and Noble have examined in factories, biometric systems are intrinsically about simplification. They circumscribe curiosity, consent, knowledge making, and speech. And yet the alternatives, which amount to building states through literacy, through teaching everybody about the importance of, of written registration and of written bureaucracy, seem to me similarly untenable. So I'm just going to show you some pictures of how this works in South Africa. Part of my project here is to draw attention to the way these new state forms draw on the specific history of the South African state. And there's little acknowledgement of this in the World Bank literature or any of the other literatures on the story of biometrics. And the South African story, for those of you who know anything about the history, has been a conflict over fingerprint registration that has taken place in every generation back into 1900. It's a much longer conflict, for example, than the Third Reich. These produced by the late 1980s automated systems for biometrically distributing cash payments in the KwaZulu homeland. Incidentally, Lawrence, they first tried voice rec sound recognition, and they couldn't get the, they say they couldn't get people to be, to be calm enough about it. So I'm not sure, I've never actually looked in detail at it. And they were initially reluctant to use fingerprinting, thinking that it would be, people would associate it with the apartheid state. But in fact, you know, the, the, the balance of probabilities pushed everybody into using fingerprinting simply because it was what everybody understood, the subjects and the officials. So this leverages a, a century of coercive centralized biometric registration and technologies of identification that were fostered by mining. It's also important to see that the, 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 tech, the kit that people were using was in every sense just the same cheap Windows-based standardized equipment you could find today. These are older machines, this, these are from the 1990s, but the, all the tools that were being used were, this, were ultimately exactly the same systems being used by companies like Unisys who were providing technology to the banks. So that's the software, this is what the cash transfer, the front end looks like, those are essentially ATM machines that are, that are hooked up to a little biometric reader, you can't see it very clearly but it's in the middle of the picture on the left hand side. And this has fostered the development of a company that I call the anti-bank, NetOne UEPS. It's a private company that is now the direct agent of what we could call the South African model of biometric government. It has contracts with government grant, for government grants and pensions in Namibia, Botswana, Malawi, Zimbabwe. It had them in Iraq and also I'll look, show you a little more about Ghana. This company is explicitly targeting offline illiterate bank customers, what are called unbanked populations. There's an enormous amount of churn and anxiety around the company. It has been subject to a great many legal disputes, uh, the, you know, including, for example, the current tender, which is a 220 billion rand tender for the payment of grants. Uh, they are being forced to reissue that tender. There's, nonetheless, there's no mistaking the momentum of the company in capturing people in Southern Africa and around the world. There are 22 million people who exist inside the NetOne database itself. It's a separate system. It's not the same one used by the government. And essentially what they are doing in their business model is to provide a banking infrastructure. So they are lending to the people who are being paid grants by the government. And of course they have access to all the revenue, that, all the income those people earn, so they can lend to them without any risk at all. And the most, one of the most interesting things was that the World Bank last week bought 10% of this company for $100 million. So linked to this, the link between these biometric systems in the South African model is, is to connect it very closely to credit surveillance, which didn't really even exist in South Africa in 1990. So between 1990 and 2016, what we've seen is the extension of the American system of automated information about your credit, not only what you borrow, but also the, the, what you pay off on your utility bills as a means of gathering your suitability, uh, gathering information about your suitability as a bank customer. So the, the credit reference bureaus collect your name, your identity number, your address, who your employer is, your debts and payments on your telephone accounts, your cable TV, cell phone contracts, your municipal utility bills, 
your credit cards and mortgages. Now this is common, it's not only, this is, you know, the model is used everywhere now. The distinction in South Africa is it's just about all that the state has as a moralizing instrument. So if I'm an employee of a local municipality, the way I decide whether you're a, a virtuous tenant is I look up your credit history. And there are something like 20 million individual profiles in the system in South Africa. 50% of them are what we would call blacklisted customers. They can't get access to credit. And they can't typically get access to any of the things that they're asking for, whether that's access to a rent or to uh, the opportunity for employment. Now this system, over the last five years, has begun to move very rapidly around the continent. And the first is a, while we're talking about truth ma making, the first is that the <clears throat> this fantasy of capturing the unbanked lay behind the first system of biometric cash or biometric money ever implemented on the planet. In 2007, NetOne was awarded a contract by the central bank from, of Ghana for a national banking switch that uh, requires all bank customers to identify themselves biometrically. And in theory, it didn't work like this in practice, but in theory, all transactions were supposed to be bi biometrically authenticated. So you have to put your fingerprint on the reader, somebody else has to, in order to move money from one bank to the account. Now the scheme has been a dismal failure. I think that's probably the most clear thing you can say about it. The machines don't work very well, they don't access the cellular network, in general, people have been very reluctant to use it. Ghanaians haven't taken very kindly to the idea that they should be subjected to a different technology to the ones that they might use if they were in London. So there's been res resistance from the rich. And in fact, one of the astonishing things is the poor don't have any money. So, <laughs> nevertheless, what lay behind the e-switch is an obsession with bankrolling, with controlling payrolling and getting ghost employees out of the bureaucracy. And it's that interest in separating out duplications within the, within the government bureaucracy itself that remains. The most outrageous of these schemes was the announcement in 2013 in Cape Town that MasterCard would actually be issuing the Federal, government, Federal Republic of, of Nigeria's identity card. I won't elaborate, but if you just think about that for a minute, this is a trip, uh, there's a lot I could say. And I have a great deal of sympathy with the officials responsible for implementing this system. I would probably do the same thing myself, but <clears throat> there's no question that it is set to, sets in place an astonishing precedent and there is very, very little legal apparatus in place to deal with it. Of course, many of these things don't work. You just have to deal with, large, you know, any brick layer is never gonna be biometrically captured and there isn't a currently a way of dealing with them. After a decade of issuing identity cards, Nigerians have still only issued to 10 million people, right? So they are 160 million Nigerians. This is not going terribly efficiently. What I want to draw your attention to, however, is how the model remains in place. So I'm going to read a little bit. It's going to take me a minute. There's no sign, in other words, of official hesitation or remorse. This is from the Daily Nation last year. Kenyans will be registered afresh next year in a project that will cost 9 billion shillings. The biometric registration to be funded by the government and the private sector is part of a plan to boost revenue collection by ma mapping potential taxpayers. It is expected to curb rising cases of terrorism and crime by uprooting criminals and illegal foreigners. The end result is that we're going to have a population register with every Kenyan and from that we're going to issue digital identity cards that will have information about all citizen the citizens in the country, said Ms. Gatsabaki, who's the national registrar. The registration will start in February 2015 with a listing of foreigners set to start in April. From October, passports, national identification cards and logbooks will have biometric data of individuals which the government can access electronically. Children under 12 years will have their irises scanned. The register will also capture land details, assets and registered companies with a view of enlisting those within the tax bracket who are not paying duty. The government has... no. Sorry. <coughs> no, a coffin, you're going to pick it up. The government has set aside one billion shilling for the project that anticipates that the private sector and a public private partnership will finance the rest. Some of the costs are to be recovered through data vending to key institutions, especially those in financial services. The governor of the Central Bank of, of Kenya said that apart from its potential to mitigate risks in financial services arising from identity theft, 
This will allow the banks to identify their customers more effectively. So bi what is biometric capitalism and where is it happening? Well, banks and states are now in an intimate embrace, funding each other's work. Global corporations, donors, and the kit manufacturers all act together in a network. Laura Mann, who's recently finished her PhD on this in looking at it in Kenya, is correct in describing a new industrial policy that favors the creation, accumulation, and sharing of data, currently without meaningful privacy limits, hinged on the creation of biometric national population registers that are hooked into the credit history system. Now, this apparatus is antagonistic to the strategies of subsistence and accumulation that have dominated on the continent to this date. It's hostile, in fact, to many of the things I described earlier, the forms of resource extraction, gatekeeping, extroversion, mutualized property forms, and border transgressions. And in that sense, it's actually a definite improvement. But there are some sinister and, in fact, distressing forms, new forms of coercively imposed civic virtue that will, will require people to act as, individual, as individualized entities and be preoccupied with their algorithmically generated reputation. Personal debt, debt service, and the risks around the servicing of those debts are becoming the dominant forms of property and profit on the continent in an economic landscape where mineral titles have long predominated. This is capitalism in a world with very weak states, especially at the local government level, without formal work, where growth is demographic, and where personal debt is the most valuable resource. Thank you very much.